Major support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their family, their finances, and their futures. High Point University, the premier life skills university, focused on preparing students for the world as it is going to be. And Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. For almost 30 years now on this program, we have been observers and hopefully honest brokers of the dialogue about the issues that go on here in the region, here in the Carolinas. But now it's been particularly challenging just understanding the short-term as well as the long-term implications of the world around us. I'm Chris William and welcome again to the most widely watched and longest running source of Carolina business, policy, and public affairs seen each and every week across North and South Carolina. And ironically, on this edition, an executive profile with a global company CEO on the global crises that face us all. In a moment, the president and chief executive officer of Sealed Air, Ted Dahini, joins us. Please stay with us. Gratefully acknowledging support by Martin Marietta, a leading provider of natural resource-based building materials, providing the foundation upon which our communities improve and grow. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at bearings.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, an executive profile featuring Ted Doheny, president and CEO of Sealed Air. Welcome again to our dialogue and joining us now from his office in Charlotte is uh, at a safe distance is the president and chief executive officer of Sealed Air, Ted Dahini. Ted, welcome to the program and hope you're staying safe. Great. Thanks, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here with you remotely. <laughs> uh, Ted, let's start with an obvious question. Uh, Sealed Air, long time global manufacturer, global packaging. You're at the, you, you had a global packaging company during a global crisis, not just public health, but community relations and race relations. What, what particular point of view do you have given the last few months from a global point of view? Um, good question, broad question. Um, what pops into mind when you s use the word crisis and especially global, it really has helped us think about what we really do and what our purpose is and how we perform. And the, the first thing that's hit with the crisis that we had to think about was safety, safety of our people, um, safety of our customers. It really taught us a lot about how essential our products are and globally brought in a lot of different in, uh, issues as well, because especially with this crisis starting in China, we're in China, so we got to learn quickly, how do we react, how do we move? Um, we had to learn about what essential products are. Good news is we learned about what critical products were, our manufacturing, et cetera. So um, globally, we're connected. Um, the crisis has affected all of us, and just the whole name, pandemic. This is affecting the entire world. And uh, so as a company, the, the piece on the company that's been really interesting for me is we've defined our purpose statement of what we do. And we start with, we're in the business to protect. And that's been resonating. The next piece is we're, we focus on critical pallet packaging challenges. The criticality is first and foremost. And then the third piece of our purpose statement it's really resonating right now. We're in the business to make the world better than we found it. So 
broad question, but that's our broad statement. And that's what we've been thinking about as we've gone through the crisis. Safety first, though. You know, Ted, you, you speak as a, um, almost as an existential CEO, somebody that looks beyond the top line or the bottom line, but that you have these, and I promise it's not a leading question or a leading statement, but it, you, you almost lead with the idea that you are communities first, um, that people first, team first, and again, this is not a leading statement. How do, you, how do you balance the idea that you're in the business to provide shareholder return, but yet you still want to be sensitive to plastics that float in the ocean and or that there is, there is a very acute debate in race relations and or that people are still getting sick from a pandemic? How do you, again, not, um, unpack this a little bit further. How do you lead a company in that way? Well, um, you have to think about how I answered the question. The first part is when we talked about purpose, when you said existential, um, you led your question with the third part of my statement, but we are in the business to protect. The reason why we focus and why I think a lot about our people, I think a lot about the societies where we live and work, um, where our products go, that's extremely important to help generate a business that we need to have to enable us to create shareholder value. So um, we are in the, in the business to do this. And what's exciting to me, if you take care of those elements, you know, solve customers great challenges in packaging and make the world better than we found it, that's a pretty interesting business to be in. And then how well do you execute on that and making a great return for our shareholders? So I think they're all, they're all connected. I want to come back to this idea of being a good corporate citizen in, 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 in a few minutes and this idea of, of also living and, and working and operating in over 120 countries and in many communities. But before we do that, 65 or so, two thirds of your business, two thirds of your revenue is derived from what has been called food care and that is packaging meats, cheeses, et cetera. Um, has that been, has that kind of exposure to that industry been Good or bad during this crisis for you, for shareholders? It, it's been both. Um, actually, the whole portfolio is been is focused on some of the criticality of the crisis. Um, some sixty five percent of our whole portfolio has been uh, seeing the uptick of the crisis. On the food side of the business, it's a little bit mixed. On the food retail, that part has been extremely strong and you see it in the grocery store. When you see the meat that you're there, the packaged meat, um, that part of the counter being empty, um, that part has been extremely strong. Now there's a mixed story there. The food service side where the restaurants, that part has been slowed down significantly. So you have to unpack the food space. Mm -hmm. Then we had the food the, the meat packing plants that you've heard about with some of the crisis where the crisis actually got into some of those facilities and we're a big player there, that boom has slowed down significantly as we're working with our customers in those meat packing plants, but that's coming back as well. Is the, does the meat packing plant, it's, and I want to cite one specific, the North Wilkesboro Tyson plant had over 500 cases of COVID that obviously was a, was a secular hit, is that, are these, and I don't, I don't want to minimize it by saying these are one-offs, but is there a larger challenge with meat packaging, or is this about a particular facility in any particular community? So, so yes, that's a particular facility. We, we know that those facilities well. Um, we are the leader in those meat packaging plants. So, there's two parts of that question. So, the, what is this challenge is creating an opportunity and we're working with those customers on automation. If you look at actually where some of the problems are, it's where people are in harm's way. They're too close to each other. They're loading the meat into packages or into bags and they're just too close. And in this distancing touchless environment, um, that, that's going to need to change. So one of the conversions that we're working on is with the automation. So we are also in those plans. We have some forward-looking um, 
products, processes, and automated solutions that we can remove people from harm's way. And so in the crisis, we're actually accelerating that conversion. So it, it, you know, people are going to still want meat. They're going to still want it packaged. They're going to still want it packaged safely. We're just going to have to remove people from harm's way to make it safer. And uh, so this problem is turning into a business opportunity. So I'm sorry to interrupt you. Do you, you, so is, is the whole game changed if and when, I'm sorry, when there is a viable vaccine? Does the game change completely? And I don't want to say go back to normal, but, but does the pendulum swing back to some semblance of something we would recognize? As far as meat packing, Chris? Or? Is, is, yeah, I'm sorry. As far as operationally running a meat packaging or your bubble wrap business or just in general as people go through the grocery store and food shop again. Does all bets are off no, and we go back to normal? No, I, th I think this crisis is going to drive some significant change as we go through this transformation. The automation side is going to, you know, vaccine or something else. You, you that touchless environment is going to continue and actually accelerate because of this crisis. Grocery stores, you're going to start hearing more of the concept of e-groceries. Even look at the grocery stores you go today in your local market. How many people are actually going to pick up? their groceries that are already being packed by someone in the store. We're working with customers in the markets to have that, that packaging loaded through cobots and robots. Mm -hmm. So we're working on packaging, talking to, you know, automated systems that are going to be loaded in packaging. And so you're going to see the e-commerce side of food move quite quickly. And when you ask me the question about food, separating it from, our protective side or bubble wrap side, we see this market actually coming together. So you're going to be protecting that food into whatever bag that it's coming through the e-groceries. You're going to be putting cold stuff next to hot stuff. And so we're going to be wrapping and packaging that whole thing. But the e-grocery trend is actually going to be accelerated. Even the delivery mechanism. Mm -hmm where right now, how it's being delivered to your home. Think about all the stuff that's coming to your home right now. That is changing dramatically, whether it's through an Uber driver delivering it. Um, we're working with customers on drone technology. This touchless world is going to be accelerated because of this crisis. I don't want to be Pollyannish about this, but Ted, you, you sound downright optimistic and upbeat about the prospects coming up and during this, this, this crisis? Yes, I'm, I'm, not op, I'm not optimistic about the crisis, but I think the crisis is creating opportunities. This adversity is helping us do what we do better, safer, faster, and we're helping our customers with the same conversion. That meat packing plant that you talked about, Chris, mm -hmm. their biggest issue right now, we were working with them before the crisis, was absenteeism, getting people to their plant. So we were already working with them on automation because they, they needed to be more efficient in how they did it. We're now just helping them to remove people from harm's way. So these trends that are out there are going to go faster. E-commerce trend is, is booming. Um, so that was already out there pre-crisis. We're just seeing it, it going faster. And what it means to a packaging company is automation, uh, packaging that's sustainable. We're not, you're gonna, I know you're going to get to the sustainability question, um, but that's not slowing down in the crisis. We're able to talk to our customers more in the crisis, though, about why plastics are important, why plastics are essential, and in the crisis, where they're actually critical to protect, preserve, and keep, um, again, people out of harm's way. When you, it's hard to not think about, uh, Seal there, large company, as I said, approaching 5 billion annual revenue, but also almost 16,000 employees. So as you've gone through this, redeployed resources and assets and people to remote locations, either working from home or working from some other setup that wasn't normal standard operating procedure. What does the workforce at a company like Seal Air look like now? What do you think it'll look like 12 months, 
and five years from now? Will it be more remote access? Uh, great question. And, and again, top of mind, what we're thinking about, Chris, I was actually on an, an industry forum just last night, another Zoom call, talking to other people in the industry and what they're thinking about. But to level set where we are and what the crisis has done to us with this stay at home environment, just like you right now at working from home. We have roughly 16,500 employees. 10,000 of those employees are in our facilities right now that have been deemed critical, essential. But 6,000 people have been working from home. As we slowly transition back to work, and um, we're careful about doing that slowly, are we gonna to go to a full, you're gonna be at a office environment? Probably not. What percentage of that change is gonna happen? We don't know. Are we gonna be having more remote meetings, more telephonic meetings, more Zoom meetings? Yes. Is that gonna be part of how we work and how we perform and how we work with our customers going forward? Yes. Even our innovation center here, we are getting some of our new innovations approved virtually telephonically, um, with cameras, customers doing witness tests um, telephonically versus flying in here to Charlotte. So that is gonna change. The actual percentage, don't know. Um, so of those 6,000 people that are working from home today, don't know. Um, but we are designing that it's going to be a certain percentage. Some of the uh, other industry leaders I was talking to last night threw out a number of a third. Don't know, but that's what we're looking for as we make sure that we keep our people safe and work on our distancing practices. A lot of corporations and a lot of small businesses, private companies, one of their biggest challenges, one of the biggest worries is the idea of worker productivity. And if you deployed people to home, they're in a more comfortable and I would say casual environment. And the, 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 the real bugaboo is Will they continue to be as productive? Will we have them engaged when we need them engaged? Do you feel like that you at SEAL there would have enough accountability around those deployed workers to feel like you could accurately measure the productivity and would, 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 would make that more rem remote working a longer term solution? Um, another good question. I think we have to. I think uh, in the remote environment, when it was crisis mode, we actually, the attention and putting out tools, the video tools, um, I communicate to all our employees once a week through a video chat. So we're actually communicating more to our people. Our people are online more. There, there are more phone calls, more Zoom meetings. Um, the concern I have though is we are a pretty tight knit organization that personal connection, um, we're gonna have to make sure that we don't lose that and design that in. On the productivity side, we're actually more productive in this environment. We've seen that. We had our first quarter uh, results. We had one month of it. The crisis industry you got to see, we, um, our productivity is up significantly, industry leading in the, how, we're being, uh, how we're producing in this environment we got to look at that sustainability side. We're going to be doing a lot more remotely, but we still need to make sure that we have those touch points. And the one that we're really focused on is how we're staying connected with our customers because we are at the table. We are the industry leader. Those meat companies that you talk about, we're connected all the way from my level all the way into those plants. Actually, some of our employees are embedded in those plants. So we're actually thinking, how do we do some of our tools online? Let our customers design their products online. So that new world's gonna look different and uh, we gotta make sure we're connected to our people and we're connected to our customers. The fear I have is I don't think the personal side will go away for totally. So what we're thinking about, how do we make sure that we keep it safe but we still stay that that serve it, that touch point with our people and our customers going forward. Ted, you talk freely about being connected to customers and, and employees. You're, you're clearly personally approachable, but that comes through your business as well. And I, I don't mean to be too patronizing. I'm not, I'm trying to make a point here that 
you're not you you don't just adopt ESG and sustainability because it's it's corporately and politically correct that you've been doing it for a while and Seal there has been doing it for a while. Let's unpack this for a few minutes. Uh, George Floyd was murdered on camera. It ignited racial tension beyond what we've seen probably since the 60s. It engaged people in a debate now that is incendiary, is productive, is hurtful, is, is all kinds of things. And it's not just in the US. But beyond that, we've got a whole level of uh, now a generation that's uncertain about things. So as CEO of a big company, of a corporation, how do you see your role to lead your employees, the communities you work in, your family, your friends? What do you think your role is in leadership and showing this connection to communities and being sensitive to what the needs of the many are? Well, Chris, I think the first thing is you state very clearly that racism and bigotry is something that we do not support at Seal Dare, period. I shared that statement in writing. I followed up with globally on a chat, and I even personally have been checking in with employees who've responded back personally. So I think it, it does, it starts with the tone at the top, um, very clearly that it is something that we do not support. The, the other parts of that question is what are we doing if our purpose statement makes this world better than we found it? When we find something that's wrong, we fix it. And so we state our purpose, we find issues, and when we find issues, we fix those. But the other thing that we're doing that I feel good about is the company, because you were personal with your question. You talked about family. You talked about me personally is we have a dialogue. And that's what I feel good about with our team. We talk about it. This is a conversation and uh, we continue the conversation. So if people don't feel right about it, we open the door and we continue those conversations. And we keep those conversations focused on our purpose, our folk taking care of customers and we're in that business to protect. And let's keep that dialogue going. Diversity inclusion or DNI, what many corporations use, is, has been around now for over a decade, if not longer than that. And it's been a, it's become, and this is my turn, Ted, it's become a standardized division of a corporation. And that can almost be the death knell. What, ha, what has this current racial dialogue, the current uncertainty around public health, how has that changed what diversity inclusion is now at a company and, 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 and how DNI plays? in the wider strategy of a company like Seal Bear? Well, I think, again, it's got to be in the dialogue and it's got to be in our words and we've got to be, hold ourselves accountable and measurable. You know, we're very metrics driven. And so we, we look at things, we look at uh, the diversity, the diversity of my staff, it starts at the top. Mm -hmm. So um, when I came to Seal Dare, I had, um, 11 people on my staff. It's a smaller staff. We're a leaner uh, company of six, but I have two thirds of my staff is female. Um, I have uh, an African uh, American general counsel, but they're not there because they're female or African American. They're there because they're top performers. They're helping us drive our business to a different place. And, uh, we were accountable to that and uh, we talk about it. And uh, if once we say it, we have to do it. Um, just like our products that protect many, many different things, messy special, special things. If we say something, we have to do it. So we keep the dialogue going. We're held accountable, measurable. And uh, one thing that I've shared with my team that our people watch your feet more than your mouth. So they're watching, our customers are watching. So we have to deliver. Uh, we've got about a minute and a half left and, and from your perch in the C-suite, uh, I'm sure you're trying to look around a corner when it comes to the economy and for some strategic business planning. What do you think happens for the balance of 2020 for the economy? Where do you see that we start to see real solid recovery in the US, at least the US financial markets and US financial economy? 
Yeah, well, that, that it's a great question, but that's uh, predicting the economy is way past my abilities. I'll tell you what we're doing though. We're preparing for things to get slowly better, not dramatically better. We're preparing for things to the crisis not to go, not to be cured overnight, but we want to make sure that we're prepared that if it does linger, if we do have a rebound, that we're going to continue to be able to keep our people safe, offer products and services that can help our customers in those central areas. So we feel real good about that. As far as swinging back to where the world was, I don't think so. It's going to be a new normal that we're creating and we're anticipating what that's going to be. Um, I do believe that sealed air is positioned very well to be in a good place as we get through this. I do think we're going to be a better and stronger company. Not giving you a, a number on that, but I do think post-crisis, uh, we're going to be in a, a much stronger and better place. Ted, uh, I wish we had more time, and please do come back when we can sit across the table and have more uh, interesting dialogues. But thanks for your leadership, and thank you uh, uh, for being a guest on this program. Please stay safe. Great. Thanks, Chris. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by High Point University, Martin Marietta, Colonial Life, The Duke Endowment, Bearings, Grant Thornton, Sonoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you.